Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power in his grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time, can we just put our hands together for the King of Kings that's in this house today? Yes, he's the Lord of Lords. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father. We magnify his name this morning. Thank you, praise team. Anointed worship, thank you. Christian Life family, thank you for joining with worship and bringing your praise to the house of God today. What, what a heavy presence of the Lord that is in here. And I honor each and every one of you for your faithfulness. Amen, amen. I'm going to be turning to the book of Luke chapter 22 and beginning with verse 47. I'm going to also hop over to John 18 and Luke 8 as well. But we will provide all of those scriptures if... If I am uh, losing you, I am trying to pace myself here. But uh, as you're turning to Luke 22, I want to give honor to Pastor Enzi, Sister Enzi. Thank you for your faithfulness and your investment in me and my family and our church, our leadership. We love and appreciate you. And also, Bishop, I know you're watching and uh, we love and appreciate you. It's good to see Sister Kirk in the house. We love you and honor you. I can see your beaming smile even through the mask. I can see it. <laughs> love and appreciate the Kirk family amen amen Luke chapter 22 and verse 47 while he was still speaking this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples there came a crowd and the man called Judas one of the twelve was leading them he drew near to Jesus to kiss him but Jesus said to him Judas would you betray the son of man with a kiss and when those who were around him saw what would follow they said Lord shall we strike with the sword and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. John 18, 10, his account says it this way. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. And in parentheses, the servant's name was Malchus. And then finally, Luke chapter 8, verse 18. So pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. So pay attention to how you hear. Not just what you hear, but how you are posturing yourself to hear what God has to say to you this morning. Would you help me pray over our hearts and our minds to receive this word with gladness. Lord, we thank you for this amazing atmosphere of worship. Thank you for the faith and expectation as displayed by the people of God. We thank you for their faithfulness. Lord, I ask this morning that you would release your word over us, Father. In the name of Jesus, to him that has the ability to hear, let us hear what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning, in this day, in this hour, in this year of 2020. What do you want to speak to us what directives do you have for us? Lord, and we give you all the praise in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. Would somebody say amen? amen? Amen. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. A story is said to be made up of five basic components. The characters, the setting, the plot, a conflict, and a resolution. In terms of the characters, there are two types, major and minor. Major char characters are those that are most important to the central theme of the story. There are two types of which there may be a couple for each. The first main character is a protagonist. This is the main character around which the whole story revolves. The decisions made by this character will be affected by a conflict from within or externally through another character, nature, technology, society, or fate. Then you have on the other side, you have the antagonist. This character or group of characters causes the conflict for the protagonist. And then you have what are called minor characters. These are those characters in the story that are not as important as the major characters, but they still play a large part, a large part in the story. Their actions help drive the story forward. They may impact the decisions that the protagonist or the antagonist make, either helping or interfering with the conflict. 
So as we peer into the events of this story in Luke and in John, and in fact in all the Gospels you can find an account of this story, in the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, we are met with several different kinds of characters, all of which play roles of various degrees. It's easy to understand why you would want to sit down with someone like Simon Peter, let's say, and ask him about his experience that fateful night when he pulled his sword from its sheath and sliced the ear from the head of a soldier to then watch Jesus pick it up and reattach it in a moment. Or to sit down with Judas, perhaps, the man who betrayed Jesus with a kiss and then watched as he was carried off as a lamb led to the slaughter. More than that, though, I'm curious this morning about the perspective of a different man, another man, a man of obscurity, a minor character, if you will. And though his account is mentioned in all four Gospels, his name is identified merely as an afterthought in the book of John chapter 18 that we read this morning. Some 50 years after the events surrounding the crucifixion. You might say he was a man caught in the middle of a bad situation. Some would even say that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I would propose to you that this inconspicuous figure found himself right where his misfortune could meet the miracle worker. This misfortune could meet face to face with the miracle worker. The Bible is full of these kinds of characters and oftentimes they're some of the more intriguing and insightful characters in scripture. You see, not everyone occupies the space in scripture quite like a Moses or a King David or an apostle Paul. Some simply reside in the background until providence ushers them to the forefront of the scene. That happens to be the case with our guy, Malchus. So today, today I bring to you a message for Malchus. A message for Malchus. I'll be honest, church, I'm reaching for somebody this morning. I'm reaching for the Malchus in the congregation this morning. I'm reaching for you, Malchus. If you're watching online this morning, I'm reaching to you. I'm reaching for you. The Spirit of God is beckoning you. It's not just me. It's the Spirit that's speaking through me that's trying to grip your heart and trying to tug on your heartstrings this morning, Malchus. So with that, I have a message for you. Who was this Malchus? The Bible said that he was a bondservant, meaning he didn't get paid to do the dirty work. But he was a special deputy, if you will. He was a trusted servant of Caiaphas, so he had some kind of credibility built up with Caiaphas, the high priest. In fact, so much so that he was sent out to fulfill certain tasks and then report back to the high priest. And by all historical accounts, Malchus likely knew of this Jesus prior to the Garden of Gethsemane moment. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 6, this is after Jesus healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. The Pharisees weren't having it. The Bible says that at once they went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. So Caiaphas and his servant Malchus were central to this plot, this plot to take down Jesus. And because of their constant surveying of Jesus' teachings and actions, the potential was certainly there for them to be witnesses of many accounts that we read of in Scripture. When he, for instance, he taught the parables. I wonder if Malchus was within a stone's throw away to hear the voice of God teaching and preaching to the multitudes. I wonder, Malchus, were you in the vicinity when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children? I wonder, Malchus, were you close enough to see the healings of multiple people? I wonder, Malchus, were you there when he preached powerful sermons? I wonder, Malchus, did you get to witness the raising up from the dead of Lazarus? All of this took place while Malchus was aware of Jesus' existence. 
Though he probably wasn't an eyewitness to every single account, we can deduce that Malchus had witnessed firsthand the words and the miraculous signs of Jesus' power on display. Malchus, I'm preaching to you this morning. Was Malchus there the day that Caiaphas led the plot to bring Jesus to death? One could conclude with a great deal of certainty that he would have been. And given in all likelihood that Malchus knew firsthand who this Jesus was long before for his most intimate encounter. Allow me to share a timeline with you this morning that might help us better understand this curious figure called Malchus. John 18, may I lay some groundwork for you this morning in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. He knew where they would be. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. This mob, if you will, was a band of soldiers, a Roman cohort in the Greek, a tenth of a legion or six hundred men some estimate. This mob of six hundred men or so was sent to arrest one man. One man, Jesus, with clubs and with swords. What kind of figure are we out to arrest? I would imagine Malchus had to be wondering, is this the same Jesus that I've seen touch the lame? Is this the same Jesus that I've seen teach parables of a kingdom that we've never seen or heard before? Is this the same Jesus that we are taking 600 men to arrest? But guess who was at the front of the pack? Our friend Malchus. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, come, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? I love this. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You wonder what put them on the ground in such a posture. Well, when you read it in the English, it's easy to just go right over the gravity of what Jesus actually said when he uttered those words, I am. He wasn't just saying, I'm the guy you're looking for, or yeah, that's me. No, when he said those words, I am, those soldiers heard a name that was familiar. They had heard of the I am before. In fact, in this translation, he uses the same language that he spoke when he said in John, verily, verily, I say unto you before, for Abraham was, I am. And when those soldiers heard that response, they were hearing the same voice that spoke to Moses when he said, I am that I am has sent you. You tell Pharaoh, you tell my people that I am has heard where you are. I am knows right where you are. That's what Jesus was saying when he said, I am the man you're looking for. So in verse 7, he asked them again, <laughs> who is it that you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus told them again, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And this is the moment. This is the apex of the story. They then lay their hands on Jesus to seize him and to arrest him. But in verse 10, Simon Peter having a sword, he drew it and he struck the high priest and cut off his, 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 his servant's ear. And the servant's name, of course, was Malchus. So Jesus said to put Peter, put that sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Again, Luke tells us that Jesus in that moment, I want you to catch the, 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 the depth and, and, and the dynamics of this moment when Peter had just made a blunder of himself and, and messed up and, and responded in emotion. Jesus turns and he fixes what was wrong. I wonder if Malchus heard the rebuke when Jesus turned to Peter and, and spoke those stern words to Peter. After all, he stands there in shock as he attempts to process what has just happened. 
Either way, he is now privy to the words of Jesus as he imparts to them what is now unfolding in the kingdom realm. This time, though, Malchus has a new ear. I wonder if because of a new ear, a new perspective, a new point of view that he can now hear the words of Jesus differently than before. I wonder if his perception has changed since he's received a touch from God. So this is the mini sermon, if you will, that Jesus then shares. I'm in Matthew 26, 53. He says, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and will at once send one, uh, excuse me, send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against me as a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Again, Malchus, was he there in the temple, perhaps on one of those days that Jesus was teaching? Either way, this moment with Jesus is different than any other. This time, it's personal. This time, it's personal. So they transport Jesus to the trial. I don't know if at this point, if if Malchus is still at the front of the pack or maybe he's lagging behind because he's still in shock over what just took place. Uh, But I guarantee he's got to be wondering at this point what this man ever did to deserve this kind of treatment. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, Being Caiaphas' right-hand man, Malchus must have been close enough to hear those false accusations and the desperate attempt to smear the character of Jesus, the one who had just healed him earlier that night. Malchus, I'm still talking to you. Malchus, I'm still reaching for you. John 18, 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and someone spotted him and said, you, aren't you the one that was with him? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at that moment, the rooster crowed. Church, I want you to imagine with me the weight and the gravity of this moment. When this relative of Malchus, who knew, who knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that this was the same man that had just cut his relative's ear off just earlier that night, but Peter, standing there warming himself, says to him, I I don't know what you're talking about. That's not me. You must got me confused with somebody else. Don't you think that this denial by Peter to the face of Malchus's relative nonetheless made it back around to Malchus, that you got people closest to Jesus that are now denying him that will not own up to their association with him? What is it with this Jesus? How do I reconcile all that has happened in the last few hours? Something isn't right. Something isn't right. So, church, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I, I want to take you with me on a visit to Malchus the morning after his arrest, the morning after the trial. If it were even possible, I don't want to shoot him a text. As easy, convenient as that would be, I don't want to send him an email. I'm not going to just tag him on a Facebook post or even forward him a podcast, one of my favorite messages. No, I want to sit down with Malchus. I want to look him in the eyes the morning after the night that he had this encounter with Jesus. I want to look him face to face and I want to deliver this message to him personally. So come with me as we sit with this inconspicuous figure that had an encounter with God Almighty. Number one, Malchus, don't judge Jesus strictly on the character of some of his followers. 
Last night, Peter, he was foolish. He let his emotions get the best of him. He was scared and maybe reacting out of pure emotion. He didn't use good judgment. And if you gauge the temperament of Jesus based on those who were with him, for instance, they showed fear, fear of man and fear of circumstances, a a little lack of loyalty, maybe inconsistent at times. You might just get a false reading and ultimately, Malchus, are you hearing me? You might miss the Messiah. Jesus, he's got a lot of work to do with Peter. Yeah, he does. And because he loves him so much, because he loves me so much, he's going to forgive us. But last night was not his best showing. But think for a moment, Malchus. Think about what you saw with your own eyes last night when you were coming as the enemy of Jesus to arrest him and you saw his disciples scatter in fear. There was a hand that reached for you, a hand that was extended to you, a hand of mercy, a hand of compassion reached for you. As Jesus said after healing you, you were complicit in the hour of darkness, Malchus. Yeah, you took part in the evil thing, yet his hand of redemption was reaching for you in that moment Malchus and I understand that you should be able to look at his disciples look at his people and his followers for answers and what God looks like but scripture tells us in Romans chapter 3 and I know Malchus you've not read it yet but Romans 3 and 23 says for everyone has sinned we all fall short of God's glorious standard Yes, Peter and the disciples, they're, they're going to do a great job. They're going to get their act together. They're going to point people to Jesus. But Malchus, don't miss the Messiah because of a lapse of judgment on the part of his people. Malchus, do you hear me? Malchus, are you listening? How you listen? Number two, Malchus, go back and revisit everything you've experienced. You've witnessed Jesus firsthand for a couple years now, potentially, and you've seen and heard of his kingdom before. But I challenge you, Malchus, to stop right now. Stop in your tracks. Go back and listen to those messages again. But this time with your new ear. This time with your new perspective. Go back and rewind and replay those messages again. Perhaps you're going to hear it in a different light. Perhaps you're going to see him in a different light. Right after he put your ear on, he said that this was to fulfill the prophecies. You're probably familiar With the prophecies, Malchus, when Isaiah said this, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Somebody think about this right now. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Malchus, are you listening? Are you still with me, Malchus? Does that sound like the man that you arrested last night? Does that sound like a guilty man, a man of evil? Stop and revisit, Malchus, what you have seen and heard. Number three, Malchus, you are important to God. You, Malchus, are you listening, Malchus? I'm trying to... I'm trying to pour my heart out to you, Malchus. You are important to God. You may not feel like it, but Malchus... I know you've probably got some regrets. You've got some disappointments. After all, you did arrest the Savior of the world who came to die for you. But he showed you compassion even when you didn't deserve it, Malchus. You probably won't go down in history, Malchus, uh, with the same recognition as some of the people around you or even like the man who cut your ear off. In fact, most people won't even remember your name. In fact, it will only be mentioned one time in Scripture. But there is one who knows your name. There is one who will never 
forget who you are. Can somebody thank him right now? That he knows my name. He sees right where you are. He knows right where you are and what you're going through. He's not forgotten you. When men abandon you and turn their back on you, God is still the very present help in time of trouble. When we were utterly helpless, Romans says Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. At just the right time. Number four, Malchus. And lastly, don't miss what's about to happen. Don't miss what happens next. Because here in just a few hours, there's going to there's gonna happen. There's, something's going to take place that's going to change the trajectory of mankind. You know the prophecies, Malchus, of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. That's the same man that you had an encounter with last night. Do you remember when those false accusers took issue with his words? And they said, he said if he would destroy the temple, he could raise it up in three days. But let me explain, Malchus. That's not what he meant literally. He said, if I were to go and die for you, he said, don't worry because in three days I will rise again with victory in my hands, with all power in my hands. These things, Malchus, are supposed to happen. So don't miss it. It's supposed to happen for a reason. And if they do, you will know that this is the true Messiah. It was God. God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. If everything happens the way I've explained it to you, Malchus, you have a lot to think about. Oh, and by the way, Malchus, your name, it means my king. My king. I don't think that's just happenstance or Coincidence, Malchus. I know, Malchus, that your allegiance has been to Caiaphas. But right now, you have an opportunity to make a change. I know, Malchus, your allegiance has been to the world, has been to the wicked agenda. I know, Malchus, you may have turned your back on God and and you went through with your orders and you arrested the Savior of the world. But right now, Malchus, you have an opportunity to make a change. We both know that last night you met your real king, the king of kings. Before I go, remember these things, Malchus. This message is tailored just for you. Don't base your perception of Jesus strictly on his followers. Number two, be sure to stop and revisit all that he's done for you. Everything you've seen and heard was for a reason, Malchus. Number three, you were important to the God of the universe. So much so that he stopped in the middle of his own arrest to turn and look at you and heal you, restore you. All your deformities, all your damage, he repaired in just a moment. I wonder if somebody could attest to that right now, that God is the healer. He's the mender of broken things. That when I was damaged and disfigured and I was uh, mauled and I was living in sin uh, and I was running from God, that the moment I turned to him, uh, he made all things new. He is the healer. In fact, I believe he left you in better shape than the way he found you, Malchus, because that's just what He does. (laughs) He makes all things new. And finally, don't miss what's about to happen, Malchus. It has the ability to change your life forever. It can change your family. I'm talking to a Malchus right now. You have a family A family that's depending on your decision making. You have a family, Malchus, that's waiting for you to be assertive and say, you know what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No more playing games. No more running on God. I'm here to make up a decisive choice right now that God shall be the Lord of my life. He's going to be my master. He's going to be my savior. I depend on him. I need him can't live without him so this message yes it may be for a Malchus but 
I think each of us could say this message is for me. Maybe you are Malchus standing in a place of decision. Can I tell you that God knows your name? God sees you where you are in that valley of decision. Between a a rock and a hard place. Can I tell you, Malchus, that God has not forgotten who you are and what you were created to be. God has not forgotten the dreams and the visions and the promises and the prophecies that were spoken over you. Today you've been given a chance to make a change. Your trajectory can change altogether today. So pay attention to how you hear, Malchus. Luke says in chapter 6, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice. Malchus, if you're going to hear anything, hear this right now. It's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. As I open these altars right now, I've got a few questions. Are you listening today with both ears? Or do you have one turned to the world while you're trying to appease God with the other? I wonder, as the Bible says, though no man can serve two masters. I wonder if you've just gotten so accustomed to listening to the world, so much so that it's got your attention and it's, it's pulling you farther from God. It's pulling you away from the plan of God for your life. Maybe you've got one ear in the dirt and you can't fully comprehend what God is trying to say to you. What voices are you allowing to influence you to determine your path and your course of action? I wonder right now, church, I'm reaching for a Malchus. I'm reaching for somebody who needs this word today. And if you don't need it today, rest assured you're going to need it someday. It's so easy to judge God's character based on the faults and the failures of his people because uh, I've got news, we all get it wrong, but God is still perfect in all of his ways and thanks be to God that he extends his grace to you and to me and it gives us a second chance. I wonder, Malchus, do you hear me right now? I wonder, Malchus, if you can look beyond your disappointment, look beyond your shame and your guilt and your regrets and say, God, I need you. I don't want to miss the Messiah because of a moment. Oh, I wonder, Malchus, could you just meet me in the altar, Malchus? Could you just meet me at the feet of Jesus right now? Because what he did on Calvary is for you. What he did at the cross was for you, Malchus. Uh, He took all your guilt and your shame and he bore it on his back. And he said, I will give you rest. All you who are weary and heavy laden. Are you weary? Are you laden with guilt and shame? I wonder right now. If there's somebody who needs this word, let me remind you that he knows your name. He sees right where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows the questions you've got in your mind and you cannot seem to escape the turmoil. He walks with me and he talks with me. Oh, Lord, I'm ready to make you the master of my life, the Lord of my life, the Lord of it all. God, I'm ready to turn over control and say, Lord, have it all right now. He knows your name. He sees where you are. He sees you in the valley of decision. He sees you in a moment of chaos. Where two worlds collide, he sees where you are. Oh, he's pulling for you right now. He went to the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He gave it all for you. Oh, today is the day of salvation. Somebody choose this day to serve the Lord.
Tell me, tell me. 